music? Yeah, it's uh, Mongolian rock. No, I don't speak Mongolian. That's quite philosophical, chap. I mean, sometimes it's not about the understanding. It's about the feeling you get when you're listening to it. Yes, but do you like it, though? Well, that's all that matters. They're actually throat singing, which is a way of producing two different notes at once, which is why it sounds so gravelly sometimes. Well, you should check out the instruments they play. Oh, go on, you go watch them on YouTube and I'll try and get this news done if you like. Yeah, they're called The Who, and I don't mean the Roger Daltrey Who. Roger Daltrey? Never mind, it's spelled H-U. Can you press the button before you go, please? Cheers. Hit it. Come on, it's been a while since Gloomhaven, or its frosty counterpart, Frosthaven, have made the news. So don't be surprised when we do mention it quite a few times this week. Yes, it's back, and surprisingly, not in a big box that you'll have trouble fitting in the car. The latest offering from publisher Cellafair sees Gloomhaven, Buttons and Bugs, fit its solo, strategic experience in a box reportedly weighing less than a single pound. Gloomhaven, Buttons and Bugs was announced by the publisher via a July 5th update to the ongoing Gloomhaven Grand Festival over on Bakakip. What initially seemed like a convenient way to handle pre-orders for an upcoming second printing of Frosthaven, along with its colossal miniatures offering, has instead become a platform for the team to unveil several new projects. Gloomhaven, Buttons and Bugs is a strictly single-player board game that claims it will distill the series' trademark tactical combat into a compact and more portable form that relies on a grand total of just one 100 cards, along with the tiny character boards to track nearly every bit of information. Scenarios are contained on a single card, which uses tiny miniatures and coloured cubes to track positioning on a hexagonal grid. Players can choose amongst the six core Gloomhaven classes, and all of their abilities are contained within four double-sided cards. Like the original, the top and bottom offer different strategic choices, along with a flat movement and attack option. Unlike the original, full-sized game, ability cards are used twice before they are discarded from the player's hand. Enemies move according to simple AI commands listed on their cards, and all attacks, player and enemy, use a single six-sided modifier die to determine the result. The number of components have been intentionally slimmed down relative to its massive predecessor, so that the solo player doesn't have 14 different cards, miniature modifier tokens and trackers to keep in their head at all times. Over the course of 20 included scenarios, characters will level up in ways that should be very familiar to Gloomhaven veterans. Modifier cards can be upgraded to offer a more favourable spread, and new, stronger ability cards can be added to their deck. Gear and items also return, printed on the flip side of scenario cards. Buttons and bugs wastes no extra space. Gloomhaven Buttons and Bugs is based on the award-winning Gloom Holding the independent creation of Joe Clipfell, that recreated the flow of combat encounters using a mere 18 cards. Clipfell has returned, alongside co-designer Nikki Valens, to expand their initial design into a fully-fledged game that plays through a full session in about 20 minutes. Valens previously worked on cosmic horror board game Mountains of Madness 2nd Edition and Artisans of Splendent Vale. Those interested in pre-ordering the game can do so for $15 through the ongoing Gloomhaven Backer Kit crowdfunding campaign, where you can also check out some new information on the upcoming Gloomhaven RPG. Tigris and Euphrates is a classic Euro game about building ancient civilizations and is set to make a return this October. Considered by some to be one of the best board games ever, Tigris and Euphrates sees two to four players constructing their own civilization in ancient Mesopotamia. Loosely part of a trilogy of tile-laying games designed by Rhino Knizia, 
alongside Samurai and Through the Desert. Tigris and Euphrates has players attempting to score victory points in one of four major sectors of civilization: farming, religion, trading, and government. Throughout the game, players place tiles representing one of the four major sections on the board, scoring points through those tiles via the associated leader. However, players score points on the sector that's weakest in their civilization, meaning players will need to develop all aspects of their civilization if they want to succeed. Should opposing players' tiles ever come into contact with one another, then a conflict occurs, with only one of each type of leader able to survive in every civilization. Leaders can also be replaced through internalized conflict as well. Originally, Tigris and Euphrates was set to be published via Z-Man Games, the studio responsible for releasing co-op board game Pandemic, as part of the company's Euro Classics line sometime last year. However, support for the brand was discontinued at the beginning of 2021 due to various factors including the fact that Z-Man Games was no longer an indie publisher, and the need for certain members of the board game industry to take notice of its remakes in order for them to find success. In a recent interview with Canizia, the designer confirmed that Tigris and Euphrates is set to be republished at this year's Essenspiel convention, which takes place from the 5th to the 8th of October in Essen, Germany. Further details about the upcoming release are yet to be revealed, and even Knizia admitted that he has yet to see any updated graphics, or indeed anything at all. When it comes to trading card games, it seems that the men folk tend to outnumber the lady folk at quite a high ratio. But that hasn't stopped one certain young lady who has managed to pull off a win at this year's European tournament for the Yu-Gi-Oh! trading card game to be crowned the game's first female European champion. The European Yu-Gi-Oh! World Championship qualifier was held in the Dutch city of Utrecht from June 30th to July 2nd. The finale to the European Yu-Gi-Oh! National Championship series of events held across the continent. 9,935 players participated in 20 national tournaments during the championships, setting a new attendance record for the TCG's competitive scene in Europe. The finals were ultimately won by UK player Jessica Robinson, who piloted her Eureka Sanavalon Therian deck to victory against Germany's Christian Thomas using the Kashtira deck. Kashtira was the most popular deck of the tournament and almost a third of the top 64 and three of the top eight using the build. Thomas had previously used it to best British duelist Oliver Newton in the semi-finals. Robinson meanwhile saw off Thomas, fellow German player and 2019 world championship competitor Jonas Koschel during the quarterfinals, before seeing off the Labyrinth deck of another German hopeful, Zhou Ho An, in the semis. Robinson's victory earned her a place at this year's Yu-Gi-Oh! World Championships, which will be held in the card game's home of Japan next month. Robinson and Thomas will be joined by Newton, Kuschel, Anne, France's Gabriel Soucy, and Germany's Din Karbu, along with another 25 top-ranking duelists in qualifying for the World Tournament. Robinson became the second Brit in a row to claim victory at the European Nationals, following the 2022 success of Marcus Patel using his unbeaten Sun Avalon Riga deck. The win also makes her the first woman to win the European Tournament, as well as one of only very few female duelists to top a major Yu-Gi-Oh! Championship. The match, if you fancied watching it, is over on YouTube for your perusal, with proper sports commentary too. It was a pretty great d d d d d d This year's Yu-Gi-Oh! World Championship will be its first held since 2019, the result of multiple cancellations due to the COVID-19 pandemic. It will be held in Tokyo's International Exhibition Center from August 5th to the 6th, with the physical trading card games tournament joined by those for digital games like Duel Links and Master Duel. Ravensburger has been in the news recently with the whole Lorcana business still to be resolved, but it continues to churn out expansions for all its other lines, and namely Villainous, or more accurately, Star Wars Villainous. The publisher of the much-loved and highly collectible series has announced Star Wars Villainous Scum and Villainy, 
The new standalone expansion introduces three new treacherous do-badders from both the live-action universe as well as the animated series Rebels and The Clone Wars. The expansion will see much-loved or feared fan favourite bounty hunter Boba Fett taking centre stage on the box. The remaining characters joining Fett will be the seventh sister from Star Wars Rebels and Cad Bane from The Clone Wars and The Book of Boba Fett. Between these characters, there is a wide range of the galaxy's best-loved lore, and so there should be something to love for most Star Wars fans out there to enjoy straight out of the box, or indeed combine with the other Star Wars villainous sets. With the release date scheduled for early August, it won't be long before fans can sink their teeth into these treacherous villains. It's time for a trip back to the cutesy, cuddly, woodland critter world of Everdell, as publishers Starling Games move towards the shoreline in its latest game, Everdell Far Shore. Aiming to dock with retailers' shelves this autumn, the worker placement, tableau building board game will seemingly feel very familiar to all Everdell veterans. While the new title is standalone and not an expansion on the base game, players will still be managing resources, collecting a range of anthropomorphic animal workers and labouring through the changing seasons to hit their goals. James and Clarissa Wilson, creators of Everdell, who also had a hand in the board game's many offshoots and expansions, will be handling the design, which might attribute to the shared DNA between it and its newest Far Shore box. Players will encounter four new species of animals, crabs, beavers, ducks and puffins, and sail into the open waters beyond the North Shore in search of maps that will guide them to treasure and riches. How this new system fits into the mechanical core borrowed from Everdell isn't yet clear. The little information we know at the moment is pulled from a pre-order page on the publisher Starling Games' website. The board is immediately reminiscent of the forest from the original, though the big cut-out tree has been swapped for a lighthouse. Farshore will again support 1-4 to four players in sessions that last anywhere from 40-80 to 80 minutes. That does mean the board game will support solo play, with rules designed by Chrissy and Tom Pesk, and will come with all the extra components necessary to play this game on your own. Illustrator Jackie Davis has returned to once again ply her signature style to another corner of Everdale's world. Everdale Farshore is currently accepting pre-orders over on Starling Games' website for $75 per box, and says that Batch should begin shipping on August the 31st. There is no current word when to expect Farshore to show up in retail, nor what the off-the-shelf cost will indeed be. We're going to revisit one of horror cinema's seminal works of familial cannibalism and hitchhiking gone wrong, reimagined as an asymmetrical upcoming one versus all board game. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Slaughterhouse, adapts the events of the original film with one player tormenting and sequentially murdering all the rest. Designed and developed by the Grab an IP and Slap It On A Game publisher, Prospero Hall, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Slaughterhouse, is the latest in a long-running history of films and television from the 1970s, 80s and 90s that the Funko-owned studio has brought to the tabletop. Disney villainous continued success might pay the bills, but Prospero's treatment of titles such as Jaws and Rear Window prove that those translations are more than just an opportunistic cash grab. Horror board game Slaughterhouse positions one player as the Sawyer family, controlling the iconic chainsaw-wielding Leatherface, as well as older brother Nubbins and patriarch Drayton Sawyer, within the family's decrepit home. Everyone else is stuck as potential victims, stranded miles from civilization, who can only rely on each other to escape and survive. How that actually works in the games isn't clear yet. The Sawyer player moves the three members around the house, setting traps, cornering other players and systematically capturing, killing and butchering them for meat. The players sneak through rooms and hallways, evading the Sawyer family as they hunt for spare car parts, collect evidence of the family's murderous nature and scrounge for anything that might keep them alive for just one more round. Most of the mechanics seem to revolve around balancing actions and managing resource cards drawn from multiple decks. 
Achievements earned during sessions, which run between 45 minutes and an hour, can unlock new cards that can be added to the next game, changing the stakes and putting new pieces on the board for both sides to use against the other. Texas Chainsaw Massacre Slaughterhouse is currently slated for a mid-2023 release, but Prospero Hall didn't provide a more concrete date. The box will be available in retail, online and at local hobby shops in the US first, no surprise there, though no information is currently available when the rest of us may see it. And we're heading over to Board Game Geek for this week's top 5 hotness. And shock and horror, heat, pedal to the metal, isn't in there. I know, I was shocked myself. So these games on the list may already be out, due to come out, or crowdfunding at the moment. It tends to be your list based on what people are searching for over on Board Game Geek right now, and a few of them we may have spoken about already. In five. Still fighting the fight against creatures in the dark is our ever faithful monster slayer in the Witcher Old World. In four. So do you fancy yourself as the most influential clan leader in Japan? Well then you'll have to pull your kimono up, won't you? And get to it in the White Castle. In three. We've mentioned it already in the news and producing its own waves is the original Gloom Holding. In two. Also making waves, literally, are those adorable critters from Everdale, in Everdale, for sure. In one. And with Gloomhaven in the top five, and not to mention the story regarding the latest addition to the franchise this week, it's no surprise Gloomhaven, Buttons and Bugs, takes the top spot this week. And we're over to crowdfunding this week, and this week we are over on Game Found. The game this week is On the Underground. Paris and New York from Ludi Creations. It's for two to five players or solo play if you order the deluxe version. It's going to take you about an hour to play and it's for ages 14 and up. The project this week sees not only the latest standalone release of Ludi Creations on the Underground, Paris and New York City, but will also let you pick up the previously published on the Underground London and Berlin. On the Underground is a game for players who love to create players compete to build the most valuable and convenient transport network. Each player controls two to four different lines depending on the number of players. The game is over after all destination cards have been drawn and all players have taken the same number of turns. The player that has earned the most points is the winner having built the most valuable network on the underground. While seemingly a mechanically simple game, the strategic depth takes you beyond other network building games such as Ticket to Ride, Thern and Taxis and Through the Desert. Besides each game being different due to the onboard objectives, the passenger introduces a singular challenge to each turn of the game, inviting you to participate and earn points even when it's not your turn. Featuring the same minimalist yet rich aesthetic introduced in the London Berlin production, we have found the game consistently delivers a pleasing experience in both appearance and gameplay. Each map has its own special characteristics, offering variety and contrast in its gameplay, including game duration, rules complexity and interactivity between players. The Paris map, for example, is a thoughtful map offering many options. To win, you need to strike the right balance between collecting sets of tokens, managing secret destinations to which you need to connect, blocking other players while not being blocked yourself, and of course, carrying the passenger. The refined elder sibling of the London map is recommended for experienced players. The New York map, though, is a fast-paced map reflecting the hectic pace of life in the Big Apple. It encourages players to mirror real life by creating lines through Manhattan using bridges and tunnels that are more challenging to build, connecting sets of significant neighbourhoods and anticipating destinations that appear multiple times in the deck. You still have to build quickly to keep up with the always moving passenger, the brash younger sibling of the London map, focused and fun even for beginners. The deluxe edition of the game elevates both with the inclusion of upgraded components and the solo underground challenge expansion. It will also be available as a post campaign add-on and will be separately for sale after the campaign for basic edition backers and retail purchasers. And on to pledge levels. Right. Unfortunately, the project wasn't live at the time of recording, and as such, prices for the pledges weren't available. 
although the pledge levels were, so you're going to have to go with that, and then go and take a peek for yourselves. Well, first up is the first pledge level, and that is just for the game. Second level has the deluxe version, with the upgraded components to pimp it out, including that solo expansion. Lastly, you can grab the deluxe version of both Paris New York and the original London Berlin games as the third pledge. There were a few add-ons mentioned in the blurb, but I'll let you find out those for yourself. So what did you think, chap? Good, aren't they? I mean, those instruments are pretty impressive, aren't they? Oh, you want to have a go at throat singing, do you? Um, okay, go on then. Yeah, I think you need a bit of practice, but a good start. Right, say goodbye to everyone. And it's a goodbye from me, peeps. Keep safe, meeples. Keep those dice rolling. The card's shuffling, and we'll be right here for you next week.